Last Sunday we covered uh, the parable of the leaven and I, I pray that was a blessing to you. I know it was to me as I prepared it. And rather for me than to, for me to review and sort of go over some of those things, I wonder if you can just share with us in a few words maybe something that stuck with you, that spoke to you about the parable of the leaven and, and it's speaking of course of the inner work that the concepts or the message of the kingdom of heaven uh, makes, the difference it makes within and we looked at that and how leaven affects us that way. Anyone that uh, remembers anything else? Yeah, Brother Jack. Well, okay, yep. Alright. Okay, that was in regards to the mustard seed parable, but what about the one and the leaven that we did last Last Sunday. Yes, Joseph. What's Very good. Yeah, it actually affects every molecule, doesn't it? And it creates a change and imprints in that lump of, of flour, as it were, uh, of, 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 of dough. It imprints its its qualities. Yes, Brother Mark. I like that um, term single molecule. Yeah. Um, God. Yes. Just God. Yeah. A little bit of God goes a long way. <laughs> a long way, okay. And, uh, and in that sense, it's, it affects every molecule and every particle of our being. And we saw the kingdom of heaven in, in work within us. Okay, anyone else uh, that maybe remembers? That? Yeah, please, just to go. Yeah. It's, uh, I like that. It keeps growing. It keeps growing, yes. <laughs> That's good. And that's how it should be, right? If we have the principles of the kingdom within us, the gospel, Christ within us, we're going to keep growing. There's no ending to where we can grow. And, and in fact, really, the sky's the limit in terms of growth. It's only we that limit it through our lack of faith or through our own pride and our own thinking and our own ways instead of allowing God to have His way. A very good point. Anyone else remembers anything? Yes, Sister Kath, please. Yes, um, something that I got from was to really make sure that you, when you look at a word like Levin, that you interpret it correctly in the context of that scripture. Yes. Very good. Very good. We, we saw that, didn't we? That all too often, leaven can, it has a negative connotation in most of the verses you read. And yet, in the parable that Jesus taught, it has a very positive connotation and it's to do with the context of what he is teaching. A very valid point because otherwise we come away with all the wrong understanding of what the parable is about. Anyone else with any points of review? Yes? Very good. Okay. Right, very good. We saw that that was the main character in the parable and it was to do with the fact that the church seems to be uh, the one responsible as a body for putting in this leaven. And you and I, as a body of Christ, we are to spread this leaven of God's Word and its precious and the principles of the Kingdom. All right, some very good review there. Well, let's have a look at our parable for today. Well, obviously, we want to move on to... Uh, in fact, it's the next two parables that I'd like to try and cover today if we can because they, they obviously are speaking of the very same topic albeit from a slightly different angle. If you remember, we said that there were seven parables in this, in this portion of Scripture in chapter 13. Uh, seven parables which reflected five principles of the kingdom of heaven. Now, we've looked at the principle of the dissemination in the parable of the sower and the seed. Then in the next parable, the one of the tares, we saw that there were obstacles to the successes and the spreading of the growth of the kingdom. And uh, Jesus is quite fair to show us that the kingdom is not just going to grow easily necessarily. It will grow. There won't be anything stopping the church of the living God. However, uh, there are obstacles and the tears were sown by an enemy and we need to be careful of that. And then we looked at the parables of the mustard seed and the leaven and we saw in that the mustard seed was the external influences of the kingdom of heaven whilst the leaven is the internal influence and we covered that last Sunday. Well, the next two parables which are to do with the man that finds the treasure in the field and the man who is a merchant of pearls, a hunter for pearls, both speak of the incredible importance and preciousness, the value, the amazing preciousness that's in the kingdom of heaven. And that to us, it should be the most important, the most precious thing. And both parables basically coincide on some aspects and also show us different aspects of the kingdom of heaven. They coincide certainly on the fact that, uh, well, when you find that which is so precious, you should be willing to sell everything else. Nothing else should compare we should be willing to hold on to nothing else, but we must make 
the kingdom of heaven, our personal possession. Let me start by saying the words of Jesus, what does it profit a man if you gain what? The whole world. He has the greatest riches on earth. He has everything possible, but he loses his own soul. Then he has nothing. And so we've got to be careful that we don't put the emphasis in the wrong place. And these two parables are, uh, I guess, aligned to give us this aspect of the kingdom. But we'll have a look. There are two different seekers here, and we'll try and study them together. Just so you know, these two parables are found in Matthew only, and they speak about the need of recognizing the value of the kingdom of heaven. Say the value. The value. The value. I think that, that there's, there's not enough made of the value of the kingdom of heaven, of what we're talking about. Jesus said just this very thing, you know, what's a profit? If you've got everything, but you lose your soul. If you don't get heaven in the bargain, then in the deal, then you've lost everything. Let's make certain that we make, we put value on the right things. Amen. Um, regardless of the cost, we should be willing to make heaven the number one priority in our lives. The essence of these two parables is found in the facts that uh, heaven and the ownership of heaven having that as our main goal, as our driving influence, is worth more than anything else. I, I hope that by the end of this lesson, you can settle in your heart that nothing, no one, on this earth, on this planet, nothing you have, nothing that you hold on to, nothing even in, within yourself, is greater in importance and value than the kingdom of heaven that God has given you. So that if our very lives have to be laid out, laid off and just given in order to earn and to make and to enter the kingdom of heaven, then so be it. We're going to try and treat these two parables together and study them in parallel because they show two very close aspects of the same concept. Uh, and uh, we will note the differences, Lord willing, and the similarities between them. And I hope that you will see both of them teach the same truth. Let's read together at verse 44 of Matthew 13 and we read through to verse 46. Please notice that Jesus did not give any specific explanation for these two parables. However, we know from Scripture and from understanding other Scriptures, uh, we can comprehend what he's saying and how he's teaching us. Verse 44 says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure. <clears throat> notice it didn't say a treasure, but what? Treasure hid in a field, which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for the joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field. Again, verse 45, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he has found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. A simple reading straight away tells us several things about it. Clearly, there is something of value implied here. Something so valuable that it's worth getting rid of or selling, if you please, everything else for. Now, of course, as a believer, you have no problem in equating this thing of great value to that which is the Lord. But, you know, in real practice, when we really sort of have a look at our lives, all too often we find a different manner or a different thinking in ourselves. We find that we put a great deal of value on temporal things, on things that don't really matter. Things that today exist, tomorrow uh, break down and don't exist any longer. We seem to put an emphasis on things that are temporal rather than spiritual, material rather than that which is by far more important in God. And when we do that, we have the wrong order. It's not that we shouldn't care for, for temporal things, but we shouldn't have them in importance above that which is spiritual. Amen? And that is the essence that we learn here from the teaching of Jesus. So, let's analyze this a little bit together and see what we can learn together from, from these parables. Jesus challenges our minds once again here to understand yet another aspect of the kingdom of heaven. And this time, it's, it's value and how different individuals uh, come to get a hold of the value and also make it their own. And uh, I want to remind you as you... Uh, study this with me to keep in, in, in mind the central purpose of the Lord giving parables is to teach us about the kingdom of heaven. That's what he's doing all this about, is to tell us more about the kingdom of heaven. Why do you think the Lord is so intent on teaching us about the kingdom of heaven? Why, why is he making such effort? What do you think is, is, is his purpose? Yeah, but yeah. Um, he wants us to be <coughs> All right. 
Okay, he wants us to be a part of it. I mean, if, if, if hell has been made for the devil and his angels, heaven has been made for the saints. Amen? And he wants you to be there eternally. He wants you to make it. He wants you to understand it, that you treasure it and make it your priority in life. Brother Casey, what were you going to say? Right. Okay, very good. All right. Ultimately, it's the goal. It's where we need to be. And certainly, we need to understand it because of it. Brother Robert, what would you say? Yeah. Yes. Okay, very good. Very good. It is something not only that is a gift and a present, and not only the, the fact that it should be present in that sense in our mind at all time, it should be, at, frankly, the sole purpose for which we live now. We have many other reasons for each other, but they should all be secondary to this one primary purpose. And if we don't have that right order, then we don't have the cart and the horse in the right way around. That's what Jesus is saying. Do you want to make it to heaven? That's what he's really asking. And if so, uh, well then the principles of the kingdom must be within us. We must hold them of such great value, in such prominent place in our lives, uh, that we don't forget them and we don't let anything else take over from those things. All right, then he said, well, it is like treasure. Not a treasure, but like unto treasure. And uh, I, I guess what we begin to think about is what kind of treasure did this man find? Have you ever thought about it? He's in a field. We don't know if he's working there or if he's just walking through it. What kind of treasure do you think he might have found? Yeah, Sister Louise. Okay. Okay. Very good, all right. It's in, of incredible value to you personally, Brother Robert. Yeah. 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 Obviously, it was nothing that was worth anything. It was not only large, or at least too too much to carry, but also of value. It must have been of such importance and such value that it was worth buying the whole yeah. field. Yeah. yeah. It, it must have been more than what he had. Yeah. Yeah, true, very true. That's why he treasured it. And that's why he saw the value in this immediately. In any case, whatever the treasure is, and we're not told, uh, some have postulated that it might have been even some kind of vein of gold or silver or something, some kind of mine that he found there. Now, that's, that's possible, but it does say it was hid, and it seems that this was hid on purpose. And, uh, and the term hid, they, they take to mean that it wasn't, wasn't yet discovered. More than likely, I'll tell you what it might have been by way of a treasure. It was something that was actually a, a, a custom of the time. And that's probably why Jesus used it this way. It was actually customary in those days um, that uh, people actually hid literal treasure in, in parts of their property. Let me just read it to you from uh, this uh, source. Hiding treasures. Owing to the insecurity of property in the East from war and oppression, joined to the necessity of keeping valuable property at hand for want of secure banks or depositories, the practice of hiding precious utensils or ornaments, money and jewels has always been common. All right, often these are built up into the walls of the owner's house or, or often buried in the fields and in the gardens that he owns. So I guess if you can think of the time that we're speaking of, in the context of the time that Jesus is speaking, there weren't banks where you go and put your valuables in. They didn't have safes and such of that nature. And uh, to boot, uh, really, it wasn't unusual for some horde from another country to decide to take over and come and essentially uh, pill pillage the area that you might have lived in. In order to actually protect your goods and valuables, particularly those things that you considered were very valuable, all too often people would literally stash them. They would bury them. They would put them in a clay pot or in, in a container of any, of any kind and bury them and put them away, literally hid. Somehow this treasure could have been stashed by someone that previously owned the field. In any case, it wasn't an unusual thing and it was more than likely either a chest or some sort of large clay jar or pot containing potentially gold, maybe something of such value that couldn't be possibly left around. Uh, as I say, it was a commonplace uh, practice, and just so you know, even even in, in our day and age, we're still uncovering some of these stashes, some of these treasures. In 1998, apparently, a company uh, installing a pipeline 
in the Near East, in the Far East, sorry, um, they were actually installing a pipeline in a place called Tel Telot, which I believe it's the Far East. In any case, they, um, uh, they actually started digging up in this particular area and they uncovered one such treasure that had been stashed away. Let me get the correct uh, information for you. And uh, it actually stated here that they found in this particular jar, it was just a single large jar, 26,000 bronze coins uh, that uh, dated back to the 4th and 5th century AD. So they were quite, it was quite a find. It had been buried all of that time. Somebody had stashed away a treasure. And uh, Jesus took the opportunity of this practice, as you can see, to in- imply something, to, to tell us something. A treasure. Treasure is buried and it can be found. All right, we don't know much about the field either. We don't know much about the treasure or about the field, but we know that it's important because it's valuable. And it said it was hid in a field. Again, it doesn't tell us where or or how. And we've seen prior that the field in other parables represented the world. But what do you think the field may represent here? And for that matter, who is the man that happens on this on this treasure? Who do you think this man is? So we've got a treasure, we've got a man, we've got a field. And uh, unlike the previous examples, what is this really telling us? Any ideas? Would you like to hazard a guess here? Yeah, please, Brother Casey. We are the man? We are the man? Okay. Okay, all right, but if we follow that line of reasoning, then the treasure that, that we're talking about somehow is found in the world. And don't forget, at some stage, this guy actually goes out and he buys the field. So, is he buying the world? What is he doing here? Let's reason it through. Brother Robert, your hand. That's okay. Yep. Okay, all right. Certainly, what we're finding is extremely precious, and it's, it's beyond the world itself, isn't it? But it is stashed away in, in a place that the scripture here dis- defines as a field. Any other ideas? Any, any, yeah, please, sir. I was kind of thinking that, like, the person made, is, like, made, and it's more likely to be yep. on the phone drive Okay, all right. I guess that we have to reason because of the nature of the description and what, what follows it and what is being taught here, that the field can't be just the world at large. It's a specific area, not, not the entire world as such. And that in that sense, it's actually different. And I think uh, somebody said a bit earlier, it's different to each individual. Perhaps what we can say in this context is that not only the man can be... Sorry, brother, Brad, I just saw your hand. Yep. I'm just thinking about the truth and sell it not. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking like if a man is us and we um, you know, in that sense of giving up all we have to get salvation or to get, get what God has to offer that in that is hidden great treasure. Yes. Okay. Well, certainly there is no question that that it is to do with salvation, isn't it? To do with the kingdom of heaven. This is how we enter it. Great, great treasure. But it's not as defined as the previous parables where we saw the world being the place where the seed has been sown. Here we seem to find that the field is really something peculiar to you personally. Yes, it is us. It is us when we come to a knowledge of the kingdom. When we, in this case, almost stumble across. And I'll explain in a moment that there are generally two ways that people will come uh, to salvation. But the man in this sense is anyone who comes across the treasure. And it could be literally anybody. I believe you and I came across this treasure. Many come across the treasure, but they don't recognize it. They don't see it as a treasure. You did. And when you did, you chose to purchase it. You chose to buy into it. The field is the area in whatever context that that you were in at the time. It might have been in, the, in a church that you heard it. It might have been on the street by a tract. It might have been in whatever context that you have found yourself in that field, that area, that specific location where a treasure was revealed to you is the field at that time. So we don't look for a, sp- a specific area here so much as it, it's different with every single one of us. Some of us were just um, brought to that place, as it were, through companionship, through friendship. Others came to a church. Others maybe read some scripture, or maybe they found it in a, uh, a text or a, a, a book that they were reading. In any case, somehow, they came on a treasure. 
And here's the point. When the man found the treasure, it isn't so much the the field and the place and so that's relevant to you, but the focus here is this amazing value, the treasure that he found. He did not hesitate in buying uh, the field to secure it. Let's stop for a moment to consider the morality of this, even though it's not the focus of the parable. If you're walking in a this, in this field, someone's field, and you found something really, really valuable, what would you do? Yeah. <laughs> Did you know you got some gold bars in your field? You know, and he'd say, oh, thanks, I didn't realize that, and he'd pocket them and you'd get nothing, right? <laughs> well, that would be the honest thing to do, right? Or else, where else would you do? What would you do, Brother Graham? <laughs> uh, bury just a little bit of this gold ingot here and, and then go and say, hey buddy, are you interested in selling that, that field, you know? <laughs> Knowing all too well that there is amazing value in that field and it doesn't matter what you pay for it, chances are it's well and truly covered by the discovery there is there. Sister Louise. Very good. If the man was dishonest, what would he have done? He would have stolen it. He simply would have taken it away and not bothered to buy the field. Now, the morality of it is not the focus of the parable. So we're not going to try and discover every moral aspect of it. So, But the, Jesus has used the, this, this sort of scenario to, to show us what happens when we find treasure. Now, I want you to understand something. The law in, in, uh, in Judea, uh, Jewish law, allowed that if a person found... Let me read it to you. This is actually part of the law. Uh, Eldershame, which is a, a historian, actually wrote a beautiful book. It is called The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. And he says this, According to Jewish law, if a man found treasure in loose coins amongst the corn, so gold coins or any treasure of any kind, it would be certainly his if he bought the corn. How's that? You buy the corn, the treasure you found in it is yours. And the same applied if you found it on the ground or in the soil, he would equally certainly belong to him if he could claim ownership of the soil. This man was honest enough, he could have just simply taken quietly or taken, removed somehow. We don't know the nature of this treasure. If it had been a mine of some kind, it would have been impossible to remove without being noticed. Perhaps, as Brother Robert said earlier, it was too large a stash to remove. Whatever the case, though, he went and did the right thing. He realized that in order to own the treasure, he had to pay for the field. What is that telling us? Come on. Yeah, Brother Bill, you had your hand up. Yeah, go ahead. Brother, I'm curious what the hideth part means. The hideth part. We're coming to that. (laughs) We're coming to that. Yeah. Okay. Well, could be. We're coming to that. That's interesting. He was a Jew, don't forget. So he was probably trying to get a decent deal here. Okay. Yes, brother. Ron. It does, doesn't it? It speaks of integrity because he could have just simply removed what he wanted without really necessarily being nice. It's Louise. Okay. All right. What what is interesting? He realized that in order to obtain the treasure, he had to pay a price for where the treasure was found. Brother Peter. That's right. You recognize the value, so was willing to pay for the field. Brother Ian. <coughs> Okay. I like that thought. You've got to have the whole thing. You can't just choose and select what you want. It's a bit like finding the goodness of God, isn't it? And we discover amazing, beautiful things in a spiritual sense. It's a treasure. But you can't just take the treasure. It's going to cost something. Now, you might say, well, as we'll see in the next parable, buying the treasure itself, it's costly enough. But in this case, there was no actual cost. You couldn't have gone to someone and say, I'd like to buy the treasure that's in your field. Because they wouldn't have sold it, right? In order to own the treasure, you had to buy the field. You had to consider the whole thing. Now, there could be a chance that it wasn't sold to him. In any case, maybe this was for sale. We don't know. The fact is, he went and sold everything he had. Say everything. (laughs) I wonder if you can imagine selling everything you have to try and get your monies together to buy the one thing 
that's most valuable. Many of us would resent that condition. We hold on to the things we have far too tight. In any case, he was honest enough to want to buy the field. But, as the scripture goes on to say, which is interesting, okay, <laughs> he actually did something else. When he found it, he hid it. <laughs> this is twice this treasure has been hid, isn't it? Eh? The first time, and then the second time. I want to, to stay with me for a minute on this thought, though, that he found it. The terminology uh, of the scripture here seems to imply that he kind of stumbled on it, doesn't it? He sort of, he didn't go looking for it. He wasn't looking for treasure, was he? He sort of kind of stumbled on it. Now, he might have been working in the field. For all we know, he might have been, you know, digging away and, and he hit this clay pot and then looked inside and there it was. We don't know. He might have just been walking through the field. The scripture doesn't say. And whichever way, it's almost like he kind of stumbled on it and uh, we're not certain. And I, I guess I want to point out to you that when it comes to the gospel of the kingdom, it's a bit like some people find it almost by accident. Have you noticed that? It's almost by accident. There are actually biblical examples of this. It's not necessarily that they were looking for the treasure, although maybe subconsciously they were, but certainly they weren't actually or actively looking for the treasure. But yet when they find it, when they see it, they recognize the value of it and they'll do their utmost to purchase it. Do you remember the woman at the well that Jesus met in, in John chapter 4? It was about the middle of the day. She, she was there at an unusual time of day. There were reasons for that. Uh, chances are that she wasn't that day looking specifically to find the treasure she found. What was she going to do? She was just going to draw water from the well. She had done that so many other times. For her, it wasn't any special day. She wasn't specifically seeking. But Jesus met her there because He knew her heart and she found a treasure that day. You might say it's by accident. You might say she stumbled on the treasure. But what happened when she recognized, saw and recognized the treasure? Did she just walk away from it? What did she do with it? What was her reaction? What was her response to this treasure that she found in Christ? Yes, just there. Yeah, not only did she accept it and recognize this was the Messiah, but got so excited she began to spread it to everyone. She made it hers, in other words. It became her message. It became her salvation that day. Brother Ian. Interestingly, she left her existing activity to take on what was... And, and she spread it so far and wide that there was a major revival in that place. Okay, here's another example for you. Perhaps a, an accident, you might say, but it's never an accident, really, is it? When God is in control, it's never coincidence. What about the Philippian jailer? Here is a jailer who has done his work this way uh, so many times, so many times over. He has taken prisoners and thrown them in jail. But this time it happened to be, who was it? Paul and Silas. He did his job just like always. He put them in the, in the darkest of jails and, and he, he just secured them. I don't think he was looking for a treasure. It wasn't something that he was conscious about, but that day, according to Scripture, following an earthquake, following the potential loss of his own life, when he lost everything, when everything was on the line, you know what he discovered? He discovered a treasure. On that day, the Bible records that Paul, speaking to him, showed him and when he found it, when he saw it, that Philippian jailer recognized, immediately recognized, and got a hold of this message of the kingdom for himself and for his family. That very day they were baptized. They received the word of the Lord. The truth is that I believe God causes many individuals, as it were, to stumble on the treasure. But so many kick it aside, they don't even recognize it. Here is an example of what happens when a person sees it, recognizes it, and instead of just wanting to sort of walk away with it, goes and buys into it. Says, I want to make this mine. This is too valuable to pass up. What an incredible deal. But in. Yeah. It's not that we stumble on it. It's really we've been, we've been hooked. We've not know if we're going to go to Samaria. Yes, Jesus needed to go to Samaria, yeah. 
I guess my point is that, it, that she, from her standpoint, she might have just kind of stumbled on, like, like, like just described in this man's life. He was walking across the field and there it was. Or he turned up in the field and there was the treasure. She wasn't specifically looking. She didn't say to herself, today I'm looking for something very special. But Jesus knew her. Can you see what happens in your life sometimes? If you look in your own life, perhaps you might, you might recognize that at some stage, it was like you stumbled across the glorious truth of God. But in fact, it was planned. God had a plan. You didn't, but God did. Alan, I see your hand. Right. And, and he wanted to do it not only the right way, but apparently the legal way. And also, he didn't want to miss out on the deal. I think that we are looking at a person that is ethical and that overall in context with his time and, and period that he lived in and the law of his country that he actually was trying to do the right thing. I don't think there is any, uh, anything wrong if you found, uh, a, I don't know, a block or, or, or a property that you thought was uh, suitable or that you liked or, or what have you uh, or that you considered of value in some way uh, that you try to secure it for yourself, right? I mean, there's nothing morally inconsistent with that. Um, the fact that, that he actually found the treasure and he hid it was, uh, was simply a, a recognition that he considered this incredibly valuable. He didn't want to lose it. He didn't want to lose it. If you remember in another portion of Scripture talking about the kingdom of God, uh, Jesus said that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, suffereth violence. And the... Uh, what? Violent, take it by force. Uh, it seems there is an aggression, as it were, in terms of gaining the kingdom. You can't be pussyfooting around this thing. You can't just be half-hearted about it. If you're going to make it in, that, that takes a determination to say, I want this. I'm going to grab this. I'm going to make it mine. And I think that God actually allows for that in His economy. Yes, Al? Yeah, okay. All right. So in context, uh, we need to do things according to what God allows and not in our own way. We may come away with all sorts of other, uh, well, thoughts and, uh, and solutions, but the scripture is clear. He that enters any other way, if he enters any other way, is a thief and a robber. So here we've got a man that has found a treasure and it is of incredible value, at least to him. Now, we don't even know if it's of value to anybody else, but it is treasure according to what he recognizes. And he goes out to buy the field so that he can own the treasure. He hides it temporarily. As a, uh, Notice the present tense, by the way. It is, it's all written in the, in the present tense. He says that he actually uh, find, finds it. A man hath found, and he hideth it, and um, he goeth, and selleth, and that which he hath, and he buyeth. It's all in the present tense. I think he, he hurried to do this. He was in a hurry. He didn't, he didn't wait around. He didn't sort of linger about it. He saw an incredible opportunity and he just went for it with both hands. But notice, it cost him something. We'll come back to this man in a moment because it coincides with what happened with the other man. Something had to be given or yielded in order to receive or to gain what he wanted. Brother Ian, your hand. Um, that's 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 yes. That's yeah. Which is interesting, isn't it? It doesn't happen just at once. In context with, with the scripture, the scriptural context at least, it is a continuum or it's something that we continue to do. You don't just make a sacrifice once to get into the kingdom of heaven. It's a continuing thing. If you don't just sell once what you have, you continue to. You need to be willing to put it all on the line continuously so that you can make it in. But we'll come back to that as I say because we'd like to have a look at the comparative parable of the pearl merchant. Notice it's teaching the same context but from a slightly different angle. Now the first individual we see here is walking or working in a field and uh, perhaps uh, not actually specifically looking for anything of value and then stumbles on it as it were and he and he finds it but the obvious difference here is that unlike this man in the field this person it says again the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant man seeking what okay what's the difference with this person what's what's he doing unlike the previous guy yeah sister Jeanette he's actively looking for something of value isn't he and this shows a different seeker altogether 
It doesn't mean that the previous individual wasn't necessarily sincere because we know once he sees the treasure, he recognizes the value and wants to purchase it. So he's sincere. But here is the individual that is looking. And I guess that there are some way, uh, there are, there's another way for some people to find truth and the concepts of the kingdom of heaven. They are diligent seekers. They're individuals who know there has to be something better out there. There has to be something better. They may have, uh, uh, well, already some good things in life. But there has to be something more in life, and sometimes they spend a whole lifetime looking for it. They may look for it in all the wrong places, but they know it's there. Any people like that you know that have come to the Lord? They were looking. Sometimes these individuals go from denomination to denomination. They're looking. They're searching. They know there must be more. And I guess such for some of you, if you recall. It wasn't the first time you'd heard about God. Your heart was sincere. You were looking for more. And you kept searching, you kept looking. Maybe you, you came across uh, uh, some information, perhaps, uh, or, or it might have been uh, through involvement in some charitable organization or through, as I say, some other uh, denomination. You may even have done some good deeds in the process. Some people do amazingly good things, but ultimately, there was still something missing. If you can imagine, this per pearl merchant man had seen a lot of pearls of various values. He may have bought some, and, but he still wasn't satisfied. What was he doing? He was seeking. He was looking. And what happens is that when he comes across this one pearl, it says, of great price, this one excels. It exceeds. It overshadows anything else that he has. He's willing to sell everything else in order to purchase this one pearl. The difference between the two individuals that are depicted in the parables is that one almost stumbles on the treasure, but another is actively seeking. There are biblical examples of this. If you remember, a woman by the name of Lydia came to find the gospel when Paul was uh, preaching, but she was already there by the rivers that were praying and worshipping. She was a seeker. And when she heard the pearl of great price coming from the lips of the Apostle Paul. She quickly accepted and became one of the pivotal converts of the New Testament there in Acts. Uh, and what about that Italian man, Cornelius? Do you remember him? What kind of man was he? Hmm? What sort of individuals are the, how does the Bible describe him? Do you remember? He was a devout man. What else do we know about him? Yeah, Sister Jeanette. He gave many harms. He actually gave to the poor liberally. Brother Peter. Yeah. Okay, but we know that he was already, if you please, a seeker. He was a worshiper of God. He was already a person that had a desire to do righteousness. In fact, the scripture says that he prayed, and his prayers were of such a, a quality and nature that they came up as a memorial before God. How about that? So, you know, if you, if you please, some of these individuals that are genuine seekers could put some of us to shame with some of the things they do. And yet, and yet Cornelius was not even saved yet. He had a lot of little pearls, some pearls of some value here and there, but he didn't have the pearl of great price. And an angel came to him and says, go and fetch Peter and he will tell you what to do. Isn't that beautiful? And it wasn't until he came across this pearl of great price, the glorious message of salvation, the message of the kingdom of heaven. And what happened when, he, when Peter came? Do you remember when Peter came and preached to him and his family? What happened? What does the Bible record uh, about this event? What happened to Cornelius and his household? Yeah, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, right? While he was still speaking. Talk about ready to receive. They were willing to receive readily the beautiful truths of the kingdom of heaven. And that's what we find with some individuals that come to salvation. They are seekers. They have been through different denominations. They've been through different processes. Sometimes they've been disappointed, even despondent, even dismayed. But when they come across the pearl of great price, they recognize it. And, uh, and for this, they are willing to give up all else, all other treasures, everything else that they may obtain it. I don't know what kind of seeker you were, whether you just stumbled across, as it were, the gospel, 
uh, of, uh, or the treasure of the gospel, or whether you were a seeker that had been through a great deal already, but whichever way, when you saw the value, when you recognized this one thing, you went out to buy it. And that's exactly what this man done. Now, I guess the question that I asked myself was, why did Jesus use a pearl as the example? Why do you think? Yeah, go the end. It's the only gem, apparently, that's, um, that's created from the end. Yeah, okay. It's, it's a very interesting gem, a pearl. It's something that is quite unique in the way it comes about. Brother Robert, what did you say? Okay, yeah. The pearl of wisdom. Yeah, it is, it is, it is supposed to be uh, what, what we call, um, I guess it's, it's made biologically. It's actually made inside a little mollusk. Unlike every other gem, this one is kind of from a living being. It comes from a living being. In fact, did you know that man cannot, physically cannot make a pearl? They can make substitute, they can make fakes, many things that look like pearls. And they can even harness the little mollusk by putting a little irritant inside the little muscle so that they get irritated and they start to coat this thing and make what we call cultured pearls, which are what most pearls are like today. But men cannot make, physically make, a pearl the way this little mollusk makes them. Amazing, isn't it, when you think about it? So in other words... It's incredibly precious because it's what? It's rare. In fact, did you know that that there are very, very, very few real pearls in the world even today? There were uh, some you know, centuries back uh, oyster beds and places where they, you call you know pearls would grow, but they, it took some like ten thousand mollusks to make one pearl. Uh, you know, to actually find one pearl that was, you know, uh, what, something that you could use. And that's why they've gone to cultivated pearls today. So, I guess my point is that they are incredibly precious and they are very unique and they cannot be made by man. In that sense, it defines very clearly what the kingdom of heaven is about. You can't make this yourself. Uh, people try, by the way, they'll, they'll make fake... Uh, statements about how to make it into heaven. They'll, they'll try and imitate it. They'll try and find alternatives. They'll try to make alternatives, but they're never like the real thing. What's a pearl look like, by the way? Yeah. White and round. White and round. Yes. Black and round. Black and round. Okay. <laughs> Depends where, where you find it, I guess. But did you know, actually, that most pearls are not round? Real pearls, I'm talking about. Natural pearls. It's true. In fact, uh, I might show you a couple of pictures of, uh, of one or two now, but they're so rare. Uh, and uh, what makes them so precious, first of all, is their rarity, the fact that they just don't grow on trees. You, f you don't find them very easily. You can get lots of cultured pearls, as I say, but none of the actual or very few of the real, uh, automatically growing by themselves, growing real pearls, natural pearls, I guess. There is any of a difference between what we would call freshwater pearls and saltwater pearls. Apparently the freshwater ones are even bigger and even more hard, are harder to find and so in that sense even more rare and therefore more precious. The next thing that makes them incredibly precious is what we would call expert opinion. I don't know if you've heard the story but for many, 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 many years this uh, old lady had a painting hanging in her, in her uh, lounge room which had been given to her um, by somebody and and uh, so much so that she had taken it off the wall and, and put it uh, in the garage. And it wasn't until uh, some a few years later when she was clearing the garage and having a garage sale that it so happened an art buff, someone who knew about art, happened to be in the, in the in, in, in environs there, in the, in the neighborhood, <clears throat> and he spotted this painting. And he came closer, and he just couldn't believe his eyes, and, and he turned it over, and he analyzed it more and he asked questions and of course to her it was just a painting. Uh, you know, she had it up for a garage sale for just a few dollars. And uh, But in the eyes of this expert, all of a sudden this, this old you know, painting with the broken frame and that you know, was worth but a few bucks to her, immediately change value because somebody was able to tell her that this was an original painting by some you know, famous uh, artist and there were only a few of them in the world. It turned out eventually to be, to, to be sold for hundreds of thousands of dollars at an auction. Something that she was 
not, not selling but for a few dollars. What was the difference? The difference was the expert opinion. The, someone that knew. Someone that recognized it. For the rock. That's correct. That's right. That's right. Be- the- that's it. And, and this was happening quite frequently, apparently. That's quite correct. Yes, Philip. Uh, a few years back here in Australia, there was a fellow using a big black rock as a doorstop. And he was selling it as a doorstop. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> someone recognized it as a black opal in the States. The largest the single black opal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How's that, right? Can you see what we're saying? So, rarity is what increases the value. Is the gospel of Christ rare? Yes. It's a one and only kind. Amen. The expert opinion. Mm-hmm. When God says this is the only way, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. No man cometh to the Father by me, but by me. That's an expert opinion. It's God's own opinion that the kingdom of heaven is an amazing treasure. It's the greatest gift that He can give to humanity. That lifts the value, doesn't it? It makes it valuable. You can recognize the value. And the last thing, of course, is the durability. Pearls are incredibly durable, and that's why it's a gem. Usually, they can last and last and last. It's a naturally grown gem, and it can last many, many, many centuries. And in that sense, it is an apt symbolism of the kingdom of heaven that we're speaking about, that Jesus taught about, because the kingdom of heaven is eternal. We enter it, and it is for good. This is not a temporal gift. This is not something that will come and pass away. Aren't you glad the kind of gifts that God gives us are amazingly rich? They're just so amazing in nature. Let me show you a couple of pictures, if I may, of, um, of pearls. Here we go. You said that we're round, right? These are real pearls. They're not cultivated pearls or cultured pearls. They're some of the most famous pearls. There are quite a number of them. And almost, uh, well, most of the Asian countries and so forth have them. They're not the best pictures, but I think you can see what we're saying. The Pearl of Asia, the Hope Pearl, so-called. None of them are round. This is the Pearl of Kuwait. These are worth a fortune. And they grow naturally in this shape. And even when a... uh, It's only because of the the sort of little uh, implant that they put in mollusks that most of the the, uh, culture pearls are actually round. But the ones that grow naturally, and they grow to some value, you'll find, are actually... Uh, of, of this of this nature, different shapes. And here's one that I'd like you to, to become acquainted with because it gives you an idea of what we're really talking about. Let me see if I can, can uh, give you this next slide to show you. Uh, is it going to do it? No, it went too far. Okay, let me see here. Try, check this one out. This is called the Imperial Hong Kong Pearl. Again, it's not round, as you can see. And uh, here's some of the history of it. It, uh, it is believed to have originated in the saltwater oyster between southern China and northern Australia. Pretty close to home, right? Okay, the pearl is a silvery white color. It weighs 127.5 carats. It has dimensions of 26 by 39 millimeters. Uh, you know, you're not talking a, a, a big object, you know. It's only about this size, around about that. Okay. Um, it, it, uh, because of its irregular drop shape, the Imperial Hong Kong Pearl is described as a Baroque Pearl. It's irregular in shape. It was owned, believed to have been once owned by the Empress Su Hai, who ruled China for 48 years, way back in 1861. When she was buried, her tomb was filled with pearls and gems, and a large pearl, get this, was placed in her mouth to preserve her body. <laughs> All right, whatever. Twenty years later, her tomb was raided and robbed, and the jewels ended up in Hong Kong and purchased by Western companies, and that's where eventually this one ended up in the Imperial Pearl Syndicate in the 1940s. But this baby is worth $40 million. Little pearl like that. Can you imagine? Of great price. Can you see what we're talking about? When this merchant found the pearl of great price... He went and sold everything he had. He had to sell everything he had. (laughs) But more than that, he sold it willingly because he wanted to own this one item. This one pearl was worth more than anything else. And I want to go back to our uh, two parables and and join them here, if you will. You've seen a little bit about 
cultivated or, or natural pearls, if you please. And just like the man that found the treasure in the field, this man recognizes what others may not have seen. I dare say that if you saw something like that without its mounting and weren't told about it, you wouldn't think it's particularly pretty a thing. It's not nice and round. What do you do with it, you know? But there in your hand is $14 million of value uh, in today's market. It is an amazing thing, isn't it? And so this is where both the treasure finder and the pearl merchant, if you please, merge in their action on finding their treasure. Because this is an amazing treasure. An amazing treasure. The meaning of both parables is clear. It doesn't matter if we come across the gospel by accident, as it were, almost stumbling on it, or we think that, or whether we have been seeking all of our lives, its richness and beauty in all the wrong places, when we find it, when we find it, we must be willing to obtain it at all costs. Now, I want you to say with me this morning, at all costs. Think of what that means. At all costs costs. It doesn't matter what it costs me. And let me say to you, there's some people, it's cost, well, it's cost a lot. It's cost their family. It's cost, well, their their monies. It's cost their future or their, uh, you know, okay, their involvement in society. Sometimes it's cost uh, their occupation or their... <clears throat> Uh, the place where they uh, they could have reached in society. I guess what I'm saying is that there is going to be a cost whenever we want to become a disciple of Christ. The parables uh, that we have studied this morning are not teaching us that we can buy the gospel. You could never buy the gospel. Uh, that $40 million might as well be $400 million. It wouldn't matter. You can't buy the gospel. But it is a form of purchasing when you buy into it, when you give yourself for it. When you come into this richness of God, we must obtain it, and we must obtain it at all costs. It's not money that's going to buy the entrance into the kingdom. What is it? How is it, how is it that we can obtain this amazing treasure? Not by dollars in the pocket. Anyway, Sister Louise, how is it? You can't get it, can you? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. Yes. I, I, you've concluded my lesson perfectly, Sister Louise. That's, that's exactly that's exactly what I wanted to say. I think that's that's a, as put together as well as you could possibly imagine. If I sold everything, I still couldn't buy this pearl. And it's just what it says, if my whole life depended, if this was the essence of my life, I still couldn't do it. And yet Jesus has made a way for me, for you, every one of us to be able somehow to afford the kingdom of heaven, to buy into it and to have it as an eternal inheritance. I want you to think of this. It's by far more valuable than this pearl. But far more valuable than any treasure on earth. And yet, you and I are able to sell what we have and buy into it. Hallelujah. The parables are not teaching you can buy with dollars, but you have to buy. You have to buy the truth and not sell it. You have to be able to and be willing to, in fact, uh, well, sell all if necessary. And it doesn't matter what the cost of discipleship is. Saints, this is where the rubber hits the road. It's one thing to be a church-going person. It's another to be a consecrated, dedicated disciple of Christ. If we really want to make it into heaven, we must pay the price. And in fact, we must be willing to pay the highest price. You know what the highest price is? The highest price is all we have. All I am. You remember the, the little woman that was noted by Jesus for putting all that she had? It was only a couple of mites, but it was all that she had. We've got so much more financially than what that woman had. And yet, and yet, when we come to Christ, we must be willing to pay the highest price. It shows that we cannot have Jesus and keep our own selves. We must be willing to sell ourselves, to d give ourselves over to Him. The cost of discipleship, according to Scripture, demands all we are and all that we have to be dedicated to the Lord in service and surrender. Uh, I, I, how many times does the Lord make that clear to us? If you want to serve me, what do you do? You have to, what? Deny yourself, 
take up your cross, follow me. You see, the denial of self comes into this amazing treasure of, of purchasing this amazing treasure. Brother Bill. I'm going to make, I have, I think, about go, go ahead. Here, the parable, he doesn't uh, go and sell it because he has implied yep. sold what he That's right. Well, I guess the difference is that in this context, um, it, it was a done thing. He went and he did it. It wasn't something that he... In, in the first field there, we saw the field, he, he had to buy it. And the TH on the end of it is, speaks, speaks of a continuity of purchasing. Okay, But it is both a thing done and settled and a continuous thing that we do. When you come to Christ, you have settled the matter. This is your course, your action. It's, that's right it's done it's bought it's, it's sold and you, you've purchased you've made it yours but when it comes to the continuity aspect of it is that we've got to be willing to continually sell whatever it is that comes into our lives and get rid of it if necessary if it interferes with our progress to heaven I guess that both aspects are relevant to our walking God remember the parables are, are teaching us the value that uh, Jesus wants to see most there obviously it's not going to be able to cover every angle but certainly we, we learn from other scriptures that there there is an attitude in this selling all to buy or to buy into if you like what God has this this treasure this pearl and I think it's a uh, it's a. Uh, it's got to be done with joy, a serene surrender. Do you remember Moses? Uh, I mean, he had all of the kingdom of, of Egypt at his as at, at his disposal. Do you remember that? What does the scripture say about him in in Hebrew? It said that he he chose to suffer with the people of God rather than to enjoy what. That's right, for a season. See, so the point is, he had to exchange. But what he had at the time seemed incredibly valuable, incredibly important. And yet, what God had for him was by far greater. And Moses became a symbol of what it means to sell everything and buy into God. He gave up his riches, his position of royalty in Egypt to become the servant of the living God. What about the Apostle Paul, or as he was known as Saul, uh, before God changed his name? Do you remember what his, uh, 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 if you like, his, his you know, presentation of what he was all about. You could call it his CV, his curriculum vitae, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. You know, sat and learned at the feet of Gamaliel. You know, concerning the, the commandments of God, concerning the law, he was absolutely impeachable. He was, he was performing clearly everything that God wanted him to do. But what did he say about all of this? Yeah. He counted all but loss, all but done for the excellency talk about the pearl of great price of the knowledge of Christ Jesus can you see what you have I, can you see if God had delivered one of these babies in our hands each one of us we would be saying well look what I've got right and yet God has done by far more than that and do we rejoice in the value of what God has given us when he gave us the kingdom of heaven however you came across it However you stumbled or searched it, whichever way, God wants you, wants me to make sure that we have in our minds, in our hearts, this as a primary and most important value in our lives. You know something? Because we get busy with work, busy with family, busy with earning, busy with life, we tend to forget the value of the kingdom. And this is the sad part, is that so many minds, the minds of men and women, uh, basically do not have, uh, do not hold the value that the kingdom is has. And, and so the kingdom is not worth anywhere near as much as the material things that surround us. And we exchange, as it were, the kingdom of heaven for a mess of pottage. Here's uh, a, a thought for you, coming from uh, some notes from the Guardian of Truth. It says, churches are filled with Christians who are unwilling to weather three drops of rain to attend worship services, who would not think... Uh, uh, nothing, sorry, who would think nothing of missing an evening worship service or a worship service to watch a ball game or to attend a game, who never rhymed uh, time to read, sorry, who had to take time to read their Bibles or who pray very little on a day to day basis. The problem is that the gospel of the kingdom of heaven is not considered by them to be a treasure worth much of anything at all. When sacrifices are made in order to put Jesus first, the sacrifices are made amidst groanings and complaints. 
Oh, look what's happened to me. Uh, look what it cost me to serve God. And, uh, you know, look what I lost. Look what got broken. What is sacrificed is done with a sourpuss attitude and disposition which is attractive to no one, not even to their own children or those that look up to them who frequently grow up with this mistaken concept that Christianity is something to turn away from. Being repulsed by it, Christianity which makes a man miserable is not worth much to the owner. I think they have fair comments, don't you? When we allow our children and those around us to see that things matter more, more to us than God, things that are temporal matter by far more than the treasures of heaven, uh, then what are we really saying? Well, it's not worth having. It's not really worth a whole lot. Is it any wonder that so many are choosing to walk away? What sort of example are we giving them? Let's remember we are to sell all. We are to give all if necessary in order to keep this glorious gift. We are inclined to say that a person who discovers treasure anywhere and in any form and walks away from it is a fool. Yet, so many do that with the gospel. And here is one last thought I want to leave you with. The idea embodied in these two parables is that the kingdom of heaven is, is the most valuable of all possessions. And it can only become ours only become ours on the condition that we are willing and prepared to joyfully surrender for its sake every other treasure. Every other treasure. Remember the words of Jesus we started with this morning? What does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and he lose his own soul? Will you stand with me today? We have spoken the parables concerning the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah.